Okay, great. Well, actually, my first picture is a picture of Steve um, um, uh, in his laundry room doing experiments. I think this was two weeks ago. And uh, yes, there is a wine rack right over here. Um, but I'm going to, and I, I, I'll give a, really a talk about covering two things. One is related to this photo, why we started doing this. This is this is his laundry room. This is the equipment that he's using here, and I'll show you a little more about that in a minute. Um, but I'll talk about two things. One is um, what uh, a couple connected threads for chromatin profiling. One of which turns out you can uh, we now do it at home for social isolation reasons. Um, but there's other there was other reasons we got into it at first. And then the second thing in the last few minutes I have, I'll turn to some things which may be more relevant to this group, which is applying uh, chromatin profiling technologies to get some inferences about how RNA is involved in um, setting up chromatin structure that we're thinking a lot more about in terms of a, in terms of a biological interest. Okay. So, um, you know, we this is a brief overview of the technologies that Steve's lab has been focused on for a number of years now and how it differs from things that are more traditional for chromatin profiling. We're all interested in mapping uh, all these technologies are geared towards mapping where chromatin proteins are specifically in genomes and the traditional methods for cross-linking uh, and uh, immunoprecipitation based that's outlined here on the uh, left side of this slide but um, uh, the, you know it's not the only way of doing things and we have over the years developed a technology we called cut and run this is based on Uli Lemley's idea of tethering um, uh, tethering uh, an antibody, uh, we do it in situ uh, to a nucleus, and then uh, tethering protein A MNAs that then will, in a series of reactions, you can bind the antibody, bind protein A MNAs, activate the MNAs, and cleave this DNA. And then you're sequencing this released fragment of DNA, and that's mapping where the binding site for your protein was. That's cut and run. A couple of years ago, uh, we added, uh, we developed a version of this which we called cut and tag. Uh, instead of a protein A MNAs fusion, it uses a protein A TN5 fusion so that you tagment the binding site where the antibodies are bound. It's exactly the same strategy. Antibody binds to your transcription factor or histone modification. Um, uh, protein A TN5 binds to that antibody. And then by activation of um, TN5, you insert adapters at the binding site. Now, the advantages of this um, were actually we were quite pleased with it because the hard parts of cut and run is the downstream strips of once you have the uh, cleave DNA, you still have to polish the ends, add on adapters, and then you're ready to amplify and sequence. But with cut and tag, the adapters are actually inserted by the TN5. And so your library preparation is done. You just PCR amplify from this mixture of material, um, untagmented. Um, nuclear chromatin and tagmented fragments, and you have a library at the end. So it's faster. It's one day from cells to libraries. Um, and for both of these methods, the advantage of doing it in situ is that you really have a lot of control over what's happening at your binding site. You bind uh, the reagents in excess and then wash them very thoroughly so that there really is very, very low background for all of these methods and very um, highly specific signals uh, for the sites you care about. Of course, the, uh, the methods are both crucial that the antibodies you have work really well, and that's a critical aspect that always needs to be considered. Okay, so what have we been doing more recently? Well, this is very nice to go from cells to libraries in one day, uh, but we thought there were some improvements we could do, and what we really cared about was a step where you have to extract the DNA from a cut and tag procedure. So. TN5 is actually locked into the, onto the DNA um, at this step after it integrates. It's a gapped um, template that it's made where one strand is ligated, the other strand is not. Okay? And so this means that you have to uh, uh, treat the preparation to extract the DNA that's typically with uh, SDS and uh, protease K and then a phenyl chloroform extraction. And so that's great um, uh, for any sort of uh, lab experiment, but what we uh, what we were thinking about is that if we streamline this one step that we could then automate the entire um, uh, protocol where if we didn't have to do an elaborate DNA extraction, we could 
um, put this onto a robot where all these steps are performed uh, in an automated high throughput fashion. And then at the end, we have an array of libraries produced that we could then um, um, and increase the throughput of experiments. Okay. So what we ended up doing was this is our standard method over here. Um, this is what we published a number of years ago, or actually a year ago. Um, SDS protease K treatment, phenyl chloroform extraction, ethanol precipitation, and then that material is, is uh, PCR amplified. What we developed over the past couple of months was that we can do the entire procedure now in a single tube, starting from cells or nuclei. Uh, we add an antibody to that tube, wash it, we add uh, uh, protein A, T, and 5 to that tube, wash it, activate it, wash it. And then for the final steps to replace this extracting DNA step, we actually don't extract the DNA. We um, can use a, a low amount of SDS and temperature to release T and 5 from the template. And then instead of um, separating the cellular gunk and um, other material from the DNA, we actually just add a high concentration of triton in the PCR buffer and primers so that we can do the reaction essentially in one tube. So it's greatly simplified. The handling is much easier. Actually, getting rid of these chemicals is actually uh, a big advantage as well. And the intention of this, of course, was that we could then automate it. Now, one side effect of that was that about a month ago, we all started staying home. And having a procedure like this, which has very few uh, chemicals um, and uh, Performing it in a single tube means that we can now do this at home, and both Steve and I do do this at home. And this is Steve Hennerkopf's setup in his laundry room of the equipment that's required to do this. A month ago, or six weeks ago, we froze um, aliquots of all our cell lines down so that we would have um, material available so that we could um, um, very rarely come into lab, pick up an aliquot, come home, and process the entire procedure from cells um, to uh, amplified libraries um, in, a, in a very small scale setup here where you can um, take your nuclei, um, you have, we have antibody collections at home, we have magnets which are fairly compact that we can handle uh, samples and wash them on, and then in the end you're amplified in a PCR machine um, and you have a library that then you can uh, drop off at your sequencing facility. So this is an unexpected benefit for us. Um, where uh, you know we can continue to do actually quite a number of experiments, um, even though uh, we are staying isolated. Okay. So one other virtue of this is what we care a lot about is antibody performance, and this is at a scale where we can now where we where we can quite straightforwardly look at different antibodies and see what their yields are and what conditions they work at uh, um, um, effectively before we apply them in a, in a situation we want. And this is an example of um, Steve's experiments, I think, from a couple weeks ago, which he did at home, uh, looking at uh, different antibodies for different histone modifications um, from different companies. And in these experiments, what he cared a lot about was um, we have unfixed nuclei, which we froze um, and, and aliquoted, or lightly fixed nuclei, which uh, we also froze and aliquoted. And the question was, um, do they work equally well? Uh, do some antibodies, uh, is there in some situations where you would want to use uh, unfixed nuclei or can you have stored samples of lightly fixed nuclei where you can uh, process it or you can go through the procedure anytime you want? And in many cases, actually, we find that they, uh, you know, it depends on the antibody, but it works quite well. For example, here's two where there's a slight decrease um, a slight benefit of using native nuclei. This is comparing from the tape station results here. These are ladders, the nucleosome ladders of enriched libraries after cut and tag at home. Um, you can see that the native material gives you more uh, library product than the cross-linked material. And when we sequence this uh, and compare the estimated library size, there is actually a, a slight benefit to having native nuclei as your input material versus cross-linked material. And that's generally the case, although in other cases, you know, there's really, um, I, in my hands and in my assessment, I'd consider that actually they're both uh, uh, very uh, well-performing um, uh, materials to use. In some cases, that they're very, very similar. Okay? Um, and what the other thing it reveals is that from doing this, there are some antibodies we prefer more than others. And probably this uh, uh, has to do a lot with this actual yield uh, 
of the antibody, not only its specificity for the histone modification, but how much material it actually recovers or how much uh, how effectively it binds its modification. And that yield uh, aspect is something we care a lot about now as we get into um, profiling smaller and smaller amounts of material or single cell work, which uh, where we think yield matters a lot. And that's why we need to uh, assess what antibody we actually want to use in those experiments. Okay, so how does that actually turn out? One last quality control. This is also the same experiments actually done a couple of weeks ago at home where Steve has been profiling two different histone modifications. These are the sequencing results for those for a region which shows H3K27 trimethylation in this domain here um, and uh, uh, patterns of uh, active promoters with H3K4 trimethylation uh, shown on this side here. And what we're showing you is the differences between um, phenylchloroform extracted uh, DNA and uh, amplified for a library versus the at-home procedure um, uh, where the library occur, uh, uh, enrichment occurs in the same tube or doing the essentially the at-home procedure but actually in the lab where um, you know where it's more so it's always more convenient to be in the lab than you can uh, and the other uh, aspect that's going on here is the number of cells we're inputting into the sample starting at 60,000 here. This is pretty much what we consider a lot of cells. Um, uh, it clearly gives us very uh, robust profiles for both K27 trimethylation and for uh, active promoters with K4 trimethylation. And then going down to 20,000, 6,000, 3,000, 2,000, all the way down to very good profiles from 200 cells in a, in a tube in a reaction. Um, and then it starts to fall apart at 60 um, uh, nuclei in a, in, a, in a profiling reaction. The extracted method still uh, works uh, quite well at this level, but you're starting to see that the uh, simplified uh, single tube protocols are, are not doing as well at this extreme of uh, how many cells are in the reaction. Uh, across this wide range, it's really quite robust for any of these methods. Um, and of course, you know, and for um, these kinds of experiments where we're using cell, uh, cell lines, we don't really have a, a limit on cell numbers and you can um, play around with anywhere in this range um, conveniently, but in more challenging uh, tissues or fact sorted samples, you know, this is uh, good guidance, I think, for uh, telling you how many cells do you actually need to have in a sample to profile histone modifications, either for repressive or active modifications. Again, the performance is quite similar uh, across this wide range, and then you can start to see that it becomes, um, the signals are a little weak here, and so the noise is more apparent and you're starting to miss sites at this very low cell number, okay? So, uh, right, so part of our intention for developing a simplified protocol was to automate this procedure, which we had actually already done for uh, cut and run a couple years ago. We call this um, auto cut and run. And the idea behind that was using a liquid handling robot. We could take um, cell line samples or really any samples. We also did this with frozen xenograft uh, tumor cells, where we can, uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, as you prep the samples, you uh, either uh, disaggregate the, uh, the cells or prep nuclei. This procedure works with either nuclei or cells. Uh, and then you um, mix the, those uh, cells with magnetic con A beads to bind onto the cells, and then you use magnetic handling to move them around. And then um, this is um, performed in a 96-well array in a plate where each uh, well has um, a sample in it and gets a specific antibody that you've decided on. So you can profile about 90 samples at the same time. We have a few wells which we reserve for controls for the batch of experiments. Okay. Once you have your samples loaded into an array, it goes onto a liquid handling robot. We use a sort of older model uh, biomech liquid handling robot, which does the entire cut and run procedure of antibody steps, washing steps, uh, and uh, cleavage steps um, it, uh, over the process of over um, time of about two days of running this machine all by itself. Okay? So it's straightforward to um, convert this over to cut an auto cut and tag once you have um, the DNA extraction step dealt with. We didn't want to do phenylchloroform extractions on a robot, but if we can do it in a single tube, then it becomes much more amenable to to auto cut and uh, to an automated procedure. And this is what we've been doing for the past month. Again, this robot sits by itself, socially isolated, 
Um, and once you come in and set it up, you can leave alone and again allows us to do experiments, even though our lab, um, um, we have a lot of lab restrictions. Okay, so uh, we've been running that, it's actually running quite well. Um, it means we can now profile uh, in a parallel format, format about 90 samples through the cut and tag procedure uh, and then um, end up sequencing those live rates at the end. And uh, we think that'll be great for, um, for rapid profiling of many, many samples. So, and we, uh, we've set up the um, core facility at the Hutch, had uh, set up auto cut and run for our uh, user base at the Hutch, um, and they're now gonna be switching over to auto cut and tag to provide as a service, as a core service to, to the Hutch. And we can uh, imagine that this will be set up in other places as well, okay. So uh, the final uh, thing I wanted to just touch on, again, this is, I think this is data again from two weeks ago from Steve's laundry room. Um, uh, overall, you know, you, uh, we have what we think is now actually a, a, a setup we like in terms of how do we assess a set of antibodies we uh, find perform very well and a set of experiments that we like to do as an initial pass to just characterize uh, either new cell lines or new experimental systems that we're working on in the lab. Uh, and and uh, of course, you have specific interests. Each of us in the lab have specific interests of what we would like to profile and what we'd like to look at, but we find that it's very useful to get a, uh, a rough overview of what's going on in a cell line or an experiment. And we can do this with, um, with uh, based on the extensive literature of histone modifications, um, saying that you know from a few histone modifications, you can actually get a lot of information about what's happening in the genome. We have good antibodies to all of these now, and this is an example of a region in human K562 cells that shows you sort of the richness of doing um, cut and tag profiling on a sample where we look at two different histone uh, repressive modifications that heterochromatic K9 trimethylation or polycom regulated K27 trimethylation. This gives us regions which we infer are repressed. K36 trimethylation giving us regions which are uh, uh, undergoing uh, elongating transcription. K4 trimethylation, which gives us active promoters, K4 dimethylation, which gives us active promoters and also some enhancer elements. Uh, and then, you know, for where available, we like to compare it to ATAC seq data, which uh, detects exposed regions or exposed um, accessible DNA. And that gives us a lot of inference about both the quality and um, um, of our data and uh, assurances of, of that we're actually detecting the things we think we're detecting. But I also want to point out that you know these are experiments that were done at home in single tubes at small scale uh, cell numbers and with low sequencing depths. So each of these experiments, you know, is seven to two million uh, reads in the library, which gives us very rich information on what's happening in the genome compared to ATAC seq experiments, which have actually much higher background reads, and so you need substantial read depths. Uh, and more investment to get good detection of peaks. There's about 42 million uh, reads that went into generating this track, and only half of that gen generated all these five tracks here. And so it gives us a rich sense of what's going on in the sample and gives us a way to infer gene activity and repression in uh, developmental trajectories where we spend a lot of our lab time now thinking about. Okay, so um, I think I'm about um, actually uh, close to where I wanted to end, but I'm just going to spend maybe three minutes talking about the last section. Oh, this is, um, you know, I think I've already covered this. So I'm going to skip this slide. Although if you have questions, I can come back and just show you that we were getting good detection of active regions. Um, the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you about one project uh, uh, from a postdoc in the lab who's now going on to a job at Emory this fall. This is G2 uh, Thakur, who is working on the role of RNA in chromatin structure. I thought this would be particularly interesting to this group, where we've been interested uh, since RNA, G2 has been interested since RNA is such a substantial amount of chromatin uh, of the mass uh, of a nucleus. Uh, we're interested in applying cut and run and cut and tag technologies to looking at what's the role of that RNA in architecture or structure of the nucleus and structure of chromatin. And what she started doing was uh, combining a classic approach for looking at the role of RNA in uh, the nucleus with cut and run. And the idea is that if we do cut and run profiling for a chromatin modification, that we can infer what the role of RNA is for those uh, chromatin regions by RNAs treating the cells 
first and comparing it to our normal profiles where we do not RNA screen. So there's an outline of the procedure. In two parallel samples, you uh, have a standard profiling of a histone modification versus RNAs treating and then doing antibody detection, um, reagent tethering, and cleavage or tagmentation around the site, although these experiments have used cut and run. And uh, you know, there's a lot of literature that says that actually if you do RNAs treatment to the nucleus, you can disrupt chromatin, uh, chromatin organization. This is an example of cytology that G2 did uh, for either um, polycomb K27 trimethylation in, uh, uh, in female mouse cells, I believe, uh, and nucleolar markers. And you can see with RNAs treatment, you lose a lot of the signal for K27 trimethylation and you disperse the uh, nucleolar signal, saying that RNA was important for keeping this chromatin organized. And what she was able to show by profiling was that uh, we can detect these, uh, these dependencies um, um, by RNA's treatment followed by profiling. And this is an example down here. And I'm going to go fast because I would rather leave some time for questions. Um, that detecting the nucleolar epitope here in, uh, in a, a control reaction, we get good detection over major satellite repeats that we uh, um, map onto here. Um, but if we RNA's treat this, then the nucleolar protein signal drops tremendously. Right? Now, that um, that change uh, uh, we think is a, a structural or an architectural effect of RNA in the nucleus because if we fix the nuclei first and then RNAs treat, we get no effect of the RNAs treatment on the on the signal from N NPM. And you can see that if you fix nuclei first, then RNAs treatment does not disperse this nuclear energy. Okay. So this is basically the technology or the, the approach that we're using to say what is the importance for RNAs in organizing uh, chromatin within the nucleus. And this is a quick summary that shows that we see uh, a dependence of, uh, of chromatin profiling signals for K27 trimethylated regions, for K9 trimethylated regions. That's the difference between the control and the RNAs treated lines here, same here. But actually, promoters, active promoters marked by K4 trimethylation, they don't really care about uh, RNA, that we get a, a, a nice signals at those promoters. There's some quantitative difference, but this may just be differences in um, what the, what's going on in the nucleus. We don't uh, put much as much weight on this difference as we do on the differences that we see here. So it leads to uh, a, a profiling uh, assessment that says that uh, heterochromatic um, um, structures and polycomb regulated structures really depend a lot on RNA for, for, these, um, uh, for their organization in some ways. Now, I want to emphasize, we don't think that these modifications are going away from the cell. If we ask they, how much modification there is, there's still the amount of modification in the cells. What we think is changing is how available they are for profiling. And I want to remind you of one result from many years ago, a classic result from EM analysis of nuclei after before and after RNA treatment, where HeLa cells um, in EM um, show quite um, quite a textured appearance to the nuclei where you can see the nucleolus and then textured um, arrangements of chromatin throughout the nucleus. But if your RNAs treat these nuclei and then prep them for, um, for EM, what you'll see is that the chromatin largely collapses onto the edge of the periphery. There's much more white space in here and everything sort of collapsed around. And we think this actually may be the reason that we're getting the disappearance of heterochromatic signal is that we're getting this um, Basically, generation that the RNA is uh, inflating chromatin so that we can still detect um, chromatin um, uh, modifications, specifically in heterochromatin. But then, so we once remove uh, RNA, stuff starts to collapse. It gets uh, compacted onto these regions and then becomes less accessible to antibodies, and we can't detect it. So we think we don't really know, but we think what we uh, might be seeing is that this importance of RNA for keeping uh, regions. Uh, um, inflated or dispersed at some level. And we're interested, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, um, although this is posted in a bioarchive paper that uh, uh, G2 has submitted. Uh, but we're interested in are there specific RNAs, not only all RNAs in general in a very non specific role, but there's lots of reasons to think that specific non coding RNAs in the nucleus that are enriched in the nucleus may play a role uh, in either 
overall nuclear organization and nuclear architecture or in specific of specific regions. And we've become interested in tracing down uh, RNAs that could uh, play a role in this. Those would be highly expressed RNAs and highly nuclear enriched RNAs that might be associated with specific regions of the genome or um, globally throughout chromatin. And we've been finding these again, again, just by profiling, looking at annotated regions for long non coding RNAs, and then finding which ones are active by histone modifications that we can profile. And again, because of the standard array of uh, modifications we use, we can do this in any cell line. And I'll stop there and take any questions that you might have. Thank you.